Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Quite a lot to get through today, although a couple of, um, I suppose you could call them light-hearted potential conversations that we might have together. I didn't realise that they're opening cannabis shops in Paris now. This as a British woman is preparing to break the law by bringing back cannabis oil, which would help treat her son. We'll keep you abreast of that story. And um, I also, you know, I've got this weird relationship with vegetarianism at the moment, partly because of what's going on at home. This story that major supermarkets may have accidentally um, allowed some sort of meatiness to infiltrate their vegetarian food. Food. I, I, I would like to know, if, if you didn't know it had meat in it while you ate, when you ate it, why that would be troubling. Surely it's only if it's... I don't, yeah, we, we shall see. I'm, I'm getting told off by my 10-year-old for not taking vegetarianism seriously enough. I may try and redress the balance later in the programme, but I think we will begin with the biggest story in town. The tale of... <clears throat> well, what word would you use? I don't know. Let's just go with meetings. That seems to be legally uh, uh, innocuous. Meetings between the... Um, that, you remember that fellow who kept banging on about being anti-elite and then it turned out he was the owner of a diamond mine. So I'm, that was probably one of my favourite moments of Brexit. Like Jacob rees that doughty campaigner against the elites and privilege who um, has quite a lot of money, or at least his company has quite a lot of money invested in uh, Russia. But anyway, we digress for now. I'm told, what's his name? Aaron Banks. Um, I, read, I had to read that book that was ghostwritten by Isabel Oakeshott, the journalist at the centre of this weekend's revelations. And I didn't realise it was ghostwritten until afterwards. Uh, I had to review it for the Times Literary Supplement. Oh, Lord above. It's like this bizarre mixture of partridge-esque, and needless to say, I had the last laugh type uh, rhetoric, coupled with this really curiously jolly hockey sticks. Uh, tone. I actually quite enjoyed it. It wasn't a bad book, but um, unfortunately it was about the denigration of Britain as opposed to the success of that Leave campaign. Um, and what's happened over the weekend, as you will know, is it, it, it's turned out that a, um, I use the word advisedly. Uh, actually, do you know what? I think if you, if, you, if you see a source go to jail, you probably lose the right to be called a journalist. So I'll just say a person. A person called Isabel Oakeshott has had thousands of emails according to her, in her attic for two years. Do you know, this really is one of those mornings where I can't quite believe the words coming out of my own mouth, even though I spent most of yesterday following the development of this story. What a mess this country has become. Like, largely, I would argue, as a, as a result of the shenanigans of some of the people that we'll be discussing today. So I want to make sure I get the facts absolutely right, because they seem to change very, very quickly. There's a person called Isabel Oakeshott, who is a kind of... Um, uh, yeah, she, she just sort of does stuff for Brexit people and Lord Ashcroft and people like that. She ghost wrote the book that claimed David Cameron had had carnal relationships with a dead pig's head. Um, uh, uh, that apparently was so urgent it had to be published immediately, even though it couldn't be checked or proved. But having thousands of emails in your possession that demonstrate people like Aaron Banks and Andy Wigmore had had um, contact with Russian diplomats far in excess of anything they'd admitted to, that you can just sit on and wait until you publish a book about... Uh, what did she claim the book was going to be about? The one that Lord Ashcroft was co-writing with her? The State of the British Army. Has anyone actually spoken to Lord Ashcroft today? Do, do we know whether he knew that a book that was set to be published in his name was going to contain information demonstrating previously unsuspected contact between the Leave EU campaign and the Kremlin? I, I'd love to know. If, if you know him, if or if you know anyone that knows him, give him our number, will you? 0345 6060 973. I'd love to hear from him, or indeed anybody involved in this story today. The, the problem is that people have lied, but the people who've lied are people who've boasted about lying. I think it was in that, that book, The Bad Boys of Brexit, that one of these characters said, facts don't work, only lies work. So the idea that today we're all going to go, ooh, what did he do? They've been busted lying. It, 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 it's, a little bit, it's a little bit backwards, isn't it? It's not quite going to work like that. Anyway, for those of you who aren't across the facts... 
There were for well, we've known for two years that Banks and this Andy Wigmore character visited the Russian embassy in November 2015. We've also known, of course, because of that um, very, very, very powerful picture of anti-elite working-class values when they were photographed with Donald Trump in a golden lift, that there are links between Leave EU and the Trump campaign. What's new is the sheer scale of these contacts. Uh, Banks, Farage and Alexander Yakovenko, the Russian ambassador, had lunch together just three days after the Leave EU, EU team had been in that golden lift with Donald Trump uh, in November 2016. Then there followed multiple meetings, it seems, between Banks, Wigmore and senior Russian officials between 2015 and 2017. It also appears that the ambassador offered to help this Banks character broker a deal involving six gold mines in Siberia. I, I don't know how many people listening to this programme have ever been contacted by the Russian ambassador with an offer to help broker the purchase of six gold mines in Siberia. I'm, I'm going to go out on something of a limb here and say probably none of us ever, but as ever, prove me wrong on 0345 6060973. This is smelly. Um, this is far beyond anything that could be described, as Matthew Dancona points out in The Guardian today, as routine schmoozing. Uh, we also know that the Observer journalist Carol Cadwallader uh, was poised to go public with this story, and at that point, Isabel Oakeshott contacted the Sunday Times and sought to put her own version of events. This is um, her version of events. That today's revelations are the result of an investigation that I was carrying out with Lord Ashcroft for a book we are writing together about the state of the British Armed Forces. Hmm. Unfortunately, limited material was hacked. It's the first recorded case in history of someone's attic being hacked and was passed to third parties, so I have decided to talk to the Sunday Times. It, it goes on about the Kremlin's hybrid warfare capabilities. She says, as part of my research, I uncovered controversial information about links between Aaron Banks and his associate Andy Wigmore and the Russian embassy in London. Remember, this woman, this person, is what you would describe as an arch-Brexiter. She is um, in uh, Lord Ashcroft's employ for writing books, uh, arguably libeling. David Cameron, and she is also in the employ of Aaron Banks, ghostwriting his book called The Bad Boys of Brexit. So someone has hung someone out to dry here. We'll have to wait and see who. The relationship between Wigmore Banks and the Russian embassy began in autumn 2015 as the Brexit campaign was gearing up. And she writes, this person that ghostwrote his book, that the relationship continued throughout the referendum and beyond. Interesting. She writes, this woman who ghostwrote Aaron Banks' uh, book and who is also in the employ of Lord Ashcroft, she writes that the Kremlin was simply doing what it does so well, identifying individuals who might be useful to President Vladimir Putin's geopolitical aims and seeing what might come of it. So what you have here is a person in possession of knowledge that suggested Vladimir Putin was trying to promote his own geopolitical aims to the detriment of the United Kingdom. And while having the audacity to call herself a journalist, she stayed silent about it and would have continued to stay silent if it wasn't for the fact that a journalist called Peter Dukes, working for the website Byline, got hold of some of these emails. I believe all of these emails. When she realised that they were going to be published, that's when she got in touch with the Sunday Times. Um, in Banks and Wigmore, the Kremlin literally struck gold, writes the woman who ghost wrote Banks's book. In due course, Banks would become the single biggest donor to the Brexit campaign, putting him at the heart of British politics. As a result of the referendum, Nigel Farage, who knew nothing of these dealings... Hmm would become the single most influential opposition politician in the UK and, in a development the Russians could hardly have believed, their new English friends would fall in with Donald Trump. So, here's the thing, right? I am, just like you, very, very vulnerable to seeing and hearing what I want to hear. I have followed this a little bit more closely than most British journalists, not as closely as Peter Jukes and Carol Cadwallader, but certainly a lot more closely than anybody else in the broadcast media. Um, and I, I, I've held... I've held the reins, if you will. Um, we've got hold of Peter, I gather. Um, can you tell him we'll talk to him immediately after the break? I'm sorry to keep him, but there's no way I'm going to squeeze him into a 60-second slot on this. 
I, and I've, 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 I've pulled the reins a bit on it because it just seemed too fantastical, you know. Also, I have a, a profound dislike of the charlatans, the spivs, the snake oil sal salesmen and the demagogues who've led us towards Brexit. So I have to... You always have to be better than the enemy, don't you? So just because they indulge in shenanigans and deceit and dishonesty and barefaced lying and, and, and racist provocation, you, you have to be better than that. So you hold back from sweeping generalizations. You hold back from the belief that it's better to lie than it is to tell the truth. And, and, you, and you also have this sense of wonder, really, because if, like me, you believe that everybody is, when given the chance, fundamentally decent, with a few sociopathic exceptions, you can't quite imagine anybody thinking that you should be cozying up to the Kremlin. This, is, of course, is a regime that has recently tried to kill people on British soil, and in the case of Alexander Litvinenko a few years ago, succeeded. You just don't do it. I, I, I know it sounds horribly naive, but there's no money on earth that would make a decent British person cosy up to a regime that tries to kill people on British soil. Is there? I don't know. But now we know, and we know because this woman, Oakshot, is one of them. That's how we know this is important. You, you, you know, if it had just been written by by Peter Jukes or Carol Cadwallader or me, then you could go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But she's one of them. She ghost wrote his book. And now she's describing a successful attempt to use him to pivot British politics, an attempt undertaken by the Russian regime. Um, that is what I'm really interested in. I don't know what question to ask you. Possibly it will emerge when we speak to Peter Jukes after the break. But the bottom line here is that they know, OK? This is the point. They, they now know that Banks and Wigmore were meeting with Russian diplomats and being offered potentially lucrative business deals at precisely the same time that they were providing a bridge to Trump and seeking to promote Brexit. I'm tempted to ask why Brexit's so good for Vladimir Putin, but before we go to the break, I want to add one more thing here. And that is the far left pile in on the side of the far right on these stories. You remember how Corbyn was pathetically reluctant to um, uh, accept the truth of the Skripal poisoning. This weird relationship with the Kremlin at the two extremes of British politics is absolutely fascinating. And I am not remotely embarrassed to tell you that I don't understand it. I, I, is, it is it the case that Seamus Milne and other members of uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn's high command still sort of cling to a, to a world view that sees Stalinist Russia as being anything other than evil? I, I, is, is it the notion that, that, that somehow post-communist Russia still offers a better chance of the Marxist dream than any... I just don't get it. Why would anybody in this country cosy up to the Kremlin? Answer, in the case of the far right, well, for money. But in the case of the far left, 03456060973. There's quite a lot to get through today, as you may have noticed. We'll crack on after this. 20 minutes after 10. I've had to, if you listen to the programme on a regular basis, I've, I've had to learn to back myself in the context of national news at the moment because the stuff that I think is important doesn't always seem to register anywhere or, or, or everywhere else. Uh, this, to me, is absolutely huge. I was very surprised by what I found. This is Isabel Oakeshott, the woman who ghost-wrote Aaron Banks' absurd book, The Bad Boys of Brexit. But there's nothing absurd about the influence these people sought to exercise over the referendum result or the influence that the Kremlin sought to exercise over them. And I stress again, this is their house chronicler. This is their in-house correspondent writing now. Someone's hung someone out to dry. I'm not yet sure which way round it was. I was very surprised by what I found, which conflicted with the public accounts of the relationship with the Russian embassy that Banks and Wigmore had given. My analysis is that Banks and Wigmore were shamelessly used by the Russians. Perhaps the Englishman did not mind. And this is the killer, the killer line. And remember, this is by a woman who routinely turns up on BBC sofas and television programmes, punting the Brexit line that nobody in government is prepared to punt anymore. As always, she writes, the Kremlin Kremlin's agenda was to weaken Western democracies by fueling political and social division. And in these two incredibly well-connected men, it had highly valuable and surprisingly willing tools. I think we can probably all agree with that description of Aaron Banks and Andy Wigmore, but of course she doesn't mean it in the vernacular. She means that it worked. The Kremlin sought to weaken Western democracies by fueling political and social division. And in these two incredibly well-connected men, it had highly valuable and surprisingly willing tools, writes a woman who was on their payroll. 
Peter Jukes is the journalist and author who broke this story with Carol Codwallader of The Observer before the Sunday Times sort of undertook a, a, a spoiler tactic, if you will, after Oakshot got in touch with them. And, and I think, Peter, you can have all the time you want today. Can you just talk us through this story from the very beginning? The story, not of, you mean, you mean the Russian story, really starts off uh, with UKIP in 2013. I've just woken up. You don't want me to start in 2013, do you? You want to start with this? I'll tell you what, we might, we, we might get you in for a full explainer, but, but no, just, yeah. just in terms of the, how these emails came into your possession, I, I don't expect you to compromise a source, sure. but, but just the, the, the timeline and perhaps some challenge to Oakshot's argument that either she was hacked or that you, you came by these um, documents in, in, an, in an illicit fashion. Yes, no, absolutely, and, and you know I can guarantee. And though I'm not one to sue, journalists don't want to sue. There would be a very ca good case. The allegations are flying around uh, from her, Aaron, and Andy that you know these were hacked, stolen from them. Mm. And by the way, the weird thing about Banks and Wigmore is that they are so sort of you know matey and rude and so slobbish on on Twitter. They're actually quite sort of affable and charming in person. It's one of those bizarre things. Carol's talked to them quite a bit, and you really want to hate them, but they're not, you know, they're not actually that bad boy image. Mm. Having said that, what they've done publicly is obviously uh, very, very worrying. So what happened was that obviously, uh, I think after her book, Call Me Dave, which had that stunning hard bit of journalism that she'd, somebody would seen a photograph of David Cameron doing something with a dead pig, you know, obviously shows her journalistic integrity. She went on to write a book for, um, you know, for Aaron. Now, she, according to her own admission, had email access to their accounts, I think mainly Andy's, for the duration and went to all their meetings, you know, on their dime, whining, dining, hanging out with Nigel, what fun, what fun, as the country falls apart, whatever. For some reason during that phase, she didn't notice. I mean, you know, there's more this dozen, I'd say almost a dozen meetings, especially if you count in sort of other people. There's this guy, Alexander Udod, who was a senior uh, attache. He was their main point of contact. I think his name's in the Sunday Times. Yeah. You can write more about him. And he was expelled after Scripple um, poisoning. So they were meeting multiple, having multiple Russian meetings. Isabel didn't notice this, apparently. Now, what happened was, for some reason last October, maybe the fact that Ab Ambassador Yakovenko was named as a person of interest by Mueller, the American FBI chief, um, head of the council, you know, in the Papadopoulos, the whole Trump-Russia scandal, that was bearing down in London last October. Also, last October, let's bear in mind, for various reasons, great work by open democracy, mm. The, um, the Electoral Commission was initiating an inquiry into Aaron Banks's finances. I don't know, I think the former probably spooked more than the latter because they seemed pretty toothless. She decided to revisit her attic where those emails were rem remarkably stored, um, as you do, in gathering dust. Uh, obviously, she didn't visit her attic. She, um, I, I, I've been told, I, yes, I know, uh, it's a strong belief that she just re the the... Um, the access she already had on um, Andy's account, yeah. and and looked for keywords, came up with a substantial cache of rather worrying things. Now, had you found this, and there's more, much more to come out. I mean, the journalistic instinct is bloody hell. Well, let alone go to the police, <laughs> let alone the electoral commission. No, no, let's hold it back for a year. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a book. It's going to change the world when it's too late, and then probably you know maybe maybe some money. It's the most absurd. Uh, explanation. So my personal belief, I don't know this for sure, is that she um, thought, oh, God, bloody hell, this might... Just you know, moderate right? your language, Jukes, will you? We've got children listening. Honestly. Bloody, it's bloody not allowed. <laughs> don't, don't, well, it isn't. Well, it, 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 don't overdo it, all right? I'll let you have one, but... We, it's, 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 I've just woken up, man. I know you have. Anyway, I appreciate I, I, I appreciate that. And I'm very grateful for your attention, but I have to say that. So, um, anyway, so... I, I, I'm just trying to be a bad boy at Brexit. I'm going to be my nice bright <laughs> Go on. Gordon Bennett, she said. Um, yes. uh, she would have gone, Gordon Bennett, I ought to get this to the authorities. Mm. Uh, or, or save the country. Or just, you know, disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. We don't know if uh, if the deal went ahead, though, were on the case. Um, we don't know if, if, they, if it did go ahead, that 12 sure. million changed the vote. But you've got to let the people decide. Now, at that moment, a concerned third party, knowing this material, 
this is November, handed it to somebody else for safekeeping, that initial charge. Um, and they had access to it too. And that's that's how we got it, because that concern mounted and mounted. And then this third party... The concern uh, mounting approached. in 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 conjunction with the failure to disclose, because yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you just think, well, it was November, it's going to come out in January, February, March, yeah. April, it's yeah. still not coming out, it's still not, not coming out. And then out. Banks and Wigmore are facing the CMS. So last week, this person... I, I'd known about it for about three months, but I didn't want to pressurise anybody, and um, I was just letting them, you know, make the decision. Other people were, and also the thing was, you know, this journalistic thing. Other people knew it was sniffing around now, mm. uh, and I just didn't want it to come out the wrong way. And so I got hold of it on uh, Thursday night, and then it was a whole series of source protection, uh, checking it through, double checking things with Cow Cow. Wow, great woman to work with. She's a bloody sure. genius. Yeah. Oh, I said bloody again. She's a darn genius. Yes. Uh, and um, so. And then what happened? We did the right thing. We um, approached Aaron for comment on Saturday, on, on Friday morning. Uh, and he didn't answer, didn't answer. We were ready to go to press the next day. And then, then at 10 o'clock at night, he says, oh, I can't get access to my emails. Maybe they're in the attic or something. Yes. I can't get access to my emails or my office phone. Can you wait till Monday? Which kind of leaves you, especially if you're a proper uh, paper like The Guardian, well, you know, maybe he's right. So delay and do that. By that time, Isabel had heard about it. Furious, furious, furious. And it is a complete coincidence, by the way, that she, I'm not sure she's hacked. If you look at her Dropbox account, what looks like has happened. In April, after she had the chasing unicorns um, argument on Ma with um, Carol Cabwell, a few listeners, she appeared uh, after the Cambridge Analytica revelations on the Ma show with Carol Cabwell and said, Carol, there is no conspiracy. Stop chasing unicorns. Mm. Um, Where's the provable link? And, and arguably, she already knew herself that there was a provable link, but Carol hadn't the, found it yet. We didn't know that link at that yeah. point. In fact, the unicorns were in her attic. Mm. They were there all along. And so what happened after that? She, I think she got a bit paranoid because she noticed uh, an access to her Dropbox, and she's posted that online, said, fully investigated. It's not a hack. It's uh, It means that somebody from a public IP has logged on to the user public IP, you know, and it could have been her if she knew the password. Right. Anyway, and now that has taken off. That's where we got the emails from. It's a very convenient explanation for that. Yes. Uh, and they're doing what they do. So I'm just, I'm just, uh, d d so, because, uh, I mean, a lot of people listening are coming to this cold. I'm not. So yeah, I, no, I'm across I, everything I, you're saying. I just want to steer you to, to, towards the kind of um, uh, entry-level explainer. So you, you now have put it to Aaron Banks that you've got the proof that he had lied about how often he'd been in touch with the Russians Absolutely. and the, the nature of those relationships. He tries to yeah. put you off by uh, possibly correctly claiming that he's incapable of accessing his emails, but then suddenly the, the story pops up at the Sunday Times. So someone's got yeah. in touch with them to say, well, Whoa, anyway, we could do it in a way that might not make us look quite as bad as the Observer is probably going to make us look. Well, more than that, I mean, as come, we were sort of willing to lay, uh, delay on this. Uh, Isabel contacts um, Carol uh, slightly irate, let's put it that way, right. uh, on, on Friday night. And then on, by, she's accusing us of hacking her, uh, you know, her Dropbox, which is yeah. absurd. And then on, by... by um, by Saturday afternoon, a little bit duplicity, duplicity, I can't say it, I'm sorry, sorry, right. up. Yeah, you know what I mean, uh, suspiciously, <laughs> on, on Saturday uh, afternoon, she says, oh, just hold the story, and can I write a piece for uh, the Observer Guardian, you know, she hates them so much, that, mm. you know, so uh, there's a lot of the kind of online, the, you know, the subterfuge that goes on with journalists, cool. and, but I, but I, um, what my, forget that, in a way, the story's bigger than, well, the story's two things. I think you've been brilliant. You've been one of the few broadcast journalists who gets this. Not only has some weird stuff been going around with foreign powers and American billionaires around Brexit. The media, the media has seen almost... I'd say, and that's one of the reasons I stepped in to support Carol on various occasions, because, you know, I'm just, I'm getting old. I'm, you know, what else am I going to do with my time? There are few other people following this except you and Carol. Well, I mean, but I guess it's, she has won awards. So, I, 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 again, I'm going to steer you back onto the park because we're, we're, we're running out of time. But she has won awards. So it's almost as if people have been reluctant to do the journalism themselves, but they have recognised, for whatever reason, and this is for your book, I imagine, for, for whatever reason, they can vote for her to win an award, but they're not going to do a follow-up story in Monday or Tuesday's paper. So just just to get to where we are now, um, this this 
astonishing scenario where the woman that ghost wrote Aaron Banks' book is describing him as a highly valuable and surprisingly willing tool of the Kremlin. Um, yep. the, 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 that is essentially rolling over and admitting that it's, it's banged to rights. The emails are real. The, the relationship is true. She sat on it for a year, didn't disclose any of it, claims that Lord Ashcroft and her were writing a book together. I don't know if that's provable. That's I don't true. Know that's true. It, and so do we know if Lord Ashcroft was aware of the fact that these I people... I cannot assume he wasn't. He must have been aware. Well, he's he's a, we, we can ask him ourselves if he... If he yeah. If he, if he deigns to ring in. Um, Peter Jukes, and we will talk again, I promise you, but what happens next? Well, we have the, uh, the CMS Select Committee hearing tomorrow, where they'll be quizzed by Damien uh, Collins and the rest of the committee. Uh, you know, that's kind of mild stuff. I think law enforcement are going to be getting involved pretty quickly. And that is a point at which we can apologise for being a little late to the news, but thank Peter Dukes for his time and attention, especially given that he, I don't think he... Have you had your morning espresso yet, Peter? I'm just having it now. Well, there we are. I'm very glad to hear it. We'll talk again. Thank you for uh, almost keeping a lid on your, your, your language. My apologies if anyone still finds that word offensive. Um, I note from Twitter that Carol Codwallader, who, who broke this story with Peter Dukes, was desperately trying to get on LBC this time yesterday. I, I can't imagine why that didn't come to pass. No doubt the truth will emerge in the wash. Um, she is, of course, always welcome on this program as, as one of the finest journalists in the country. We are, however, covering a news story here rather than a phone-in topic, aren't we? Unless Lord Ashcroft wants to phone in or Aaron Banks or, or, or of course, Carol. Um, because I, I don't know that we know any more about it than we've, we've just discovered. I'm always delighted to hear from you and to talk to you and we'll talk to Sarah in a moment, but I haven't really punted for calls yet because... Well, well, the charitable analysis of the situation would be that I haven't really punted for calls yet because I don't think that we have much to add to the unfolding news story. The uncharitable analysis would be that I failed in my duty as a phone-in host to come up with a question that would invite a cavalcade of fascinating calls. Um, I don't think most people will. I, the more entrenched you are on a pro-Brexit side, the more effort you'll be putting into convincing yourself that this doesn't matter. I understand that. Uh, it's psychological. If I dropped a boo-boo on this scale, I'd probably still be desperately trying to persuade myself that I hadn't. Um, equally, I, I appreciate that the uh, the fact that Vladimir Putin presides over a regime that routinely kills and imprisons critics, dissidents and journalists and seeks to end the lives of Kremlin enemies on foreign soil, including Britain, doesn't upset a lot of people as much as it upsets me, or indeed as much as I, I think it should upset everybody who considers British uh, security to be important, considers actually British values to be important. However, we know that we live in a weird time. People can take checks from truth-phobic foreign broadcasters in return for telling lies about, damaging lies about our country. Um, and I don't just mean Russia today. You have um, a situation in which we have become so entrenched that it is almost impossible to imagine anybody crossing no man's land uh, and changing their position on something like this. And finally, I agree with Isabel Oakeshott on this, where she says that the Kremlin's agenda was to weaken Western democracies by fueling political and social division. And this will be the question that I ask you, and I do hope you ring in to answer it. Because I think, and it was very kind of Peter to suggest that, that this has been one of those corners. In fact, it was a lot better when he suggested it than it sounded when I suggested it. But there you go. We've all got character flaws. Um, I, I, I have followed this a little bit more closely than most. I, I, I owe an apology to a fellow called James Patrick who has actually led the line on a lot of this stuff, but who I felt... And we had, he was due to come in on a few occasions and the news agenda moved on and we bumped him down the line a bit and then we forgot and then the story went away. But, but he is someone we'll be talking to later in the week. He's been across this like almost nobody else. But I, and I read his stuff. He's written a whole book about a lot of this um, attempt to subvert Western democracies. And, and it just... I, could, I, didn't, I was so desperate not to believe it that I didn't. There you go, that's a good way of putting it. I, I kind of did. It was a form of cognitive dissonance because the accounting and the explanation was so plausible. He's also strong on, on the, in that, the, the potential uh, of a no-deal Brexit, actually. But he is someone you should look up. I'll, I'll, I'll retweet him later. But the point is this. The point I'm clumsily trying to make is that we followed it more closely than most but couldn't quite believe it was happening. It just seemed too fanciful, too far-fetched. But here is the woman that wrote Aaron Banks's book. As always, the Kremlin's agenda was to weaken Western democracies by fueling political and social division. And here's the bit that worries me. I think as the truth emerges, the division is going to get worse.
not better. So we know now Putin's desperate to destabilise the West. Brexit has helped. Lots and lots and lots of people voted for Brexit for reasons that have nothing to do with Putin's propaganda or the destabilisation agenda, but we know it was there. Similarly with Trump, whose next target will be NATO, the only thing on the planet, really, that Vladimir Putin is frightened of. Donald Trump not only calling for Putin to be readmitted to the G8, the mother of all humiliations for Theresa May's attempt to get an internationally cohesive response to the Skripal poisonings. So he's, he's already torn that up, he's insulted the whole of the G7, and now he's going to go after NATO. If you had to write a list of things that the president of Russia would like the president of America to do, you would struggle to come up with anything that Trump isn't already doing. So this is a fascinating story about, about pathetic little men who somehow found themselves caught up in uh, events of immense, uh, immense import, international import, through naivety or, 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 I don't know, perhaps they were starstruck. But I think it's going to get worse. I think it, as it emerges, as the truth of the links between the Levy U campaign and the Kremlin emerge, and potentially on the other side of the Atlantic, the truth of the links between the Kremlin and the Trump campaign emerge, I think things are going to get worse. And I wonder whether you agree. So how can I put this? If, if you were on the other side of the argument to me, and it becomes utterly, utterly proven that the Kremlin have been pulling the strings of a lot of these characters all along. Am I right in thinking that you're going to double down on your support for Trump and leaving the European Union rather than question whether you should really be doing something that Vladimir Putin has expended enormous effort and energy in trying to get you to do? Sarah's in Goring on Thames. Sarah, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, my name is Sarah Hurst. I write for a Ukraine-based website called Stop Fake. I write about Russian propaganda in the West. Um, so, so, you, so, you're so, right. so you're 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 not exactly new to these phenomena, then? No, I'm not new to it. I've um, been covering in detail everything that's been going on with Russia um, since the invasion of Ukraine, since the annexation of Crimea four years ago. Which again, um, Trump this weekend sort of kind of suggested was a good thing, didn't he? Yes, he basically just said, well, it was Obama's fault anyway. I forgot to put um, that on the list of things that the president of Russia would want the president of the United States of America to be doing at the moment. Of course, sort of uh, minimising the international crime of annexing Crimea would be quite near the top of the list, and he's already done it. So, so what, what, how do you think they've pulled it off then, as someone who's been watching things more closely than we have? How do you think they've pulled it off, and why didn't the alarm bells go off sooner? They've pulled it off because of our naivety and our, um, exactly as you say, um, people think this is completely far-fetched. Yes. So if you said someone is a Russian spy or there's Kremlin influence, you'll get completely laughed at because the Cold War is over, supposedly, and um, there are no Russian spies. You're, you're, you're obviously delusional. That's, that's basically how they've pulled it off. they pulled it off by stealth by looking at our weak points and going for people who might have an interest in Russia um, that they can influence, or people who are disgruntled, um, disaffected, um, lots of people. So Aaron Banks um, is married to a Russian woman who's the daughter of a state official, and um, they could they could uh, influence him through her, and they could offer... Perhaps, uh, yes. Uh, potentially. Um, yeah. But uh, you, you, drew, you drew my attention to, the, to another interesting case which I recently wrote about. You actually tweeted that um, Pavel Stroilov, who was slammed by the judge in the Alfie Evans case for being a terrible advisor to the family, mm. um, had been an aged Gerard Batten, the UKIP leader. Yes. And because of your tweet, I looked into that further and wrote an article about Pavel Stroilov, who has been doing all kinds of interesting things, unusual things, um, for many years in the UK, and has been working supposedly with dissidents, supposedly supporting them, um, including Vladimir Bukovsky, who was... Um, I, I, you know that I, 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 I'm conscious of, of libel laws, and, and I don't doubt your veracity, but if I can't double-check anything, I'm a little reluctant to ha have names I haven't heard before put out on the programme. But the, the gentleman you refer to was supposedly a law student who the, the judge in that tragic case of, of, of Alfie Evans described in, in very unflattering terms as, as doing a, I suppose we could, I think, comfortably describe a lot more harm for the family's case than good. And you're quite right. I think he co-wrote a book with Batten, the, the, the UKIP, the current... Is he still the UKIP? It changes yeah. every 10 minutes. Is he, are, we, are we sure? Um, have we checked this morning? It's not possible to know. Um, Gerard Batten wouldn't say whether Stroilov's still associated with him. He wouldn't comment. Um, but, but again, there's curious, these curious connections between um, uh, Russian interests and what we could loosely describe as far-right British politics. 
Yes, so RT is very much pushing the Tommy Robinson story. And someone I know who's, who would formerly have been moderate, who is now quite um, disgruntled and pro-Brexit, has said RT broke the Tommy Robinson story when no one else was reporting on it. So people are turning to RT and calling it information, calling it useful alternative information. The, the, the Tommy Robinson yeah. story being his imprisonment for breaching a suspended sentence with contempt of court and the, and the sort of weaponised or willful ignorance of, of people who think he's been the victim of, of something other than the rule of law. Right. And RT, Russia Today, is pushing this line and pushing him as a martyr. And do you know that Katie Hopkins is now in St. Petersburg? Not really allowed to say that name on my programme, but I'll, I'll allow you an exception. I, I, I did know that she was in St. Petersburg, saying how safe it is, um, which I think is a, a, a city with a murder rate two and a half times what London is. So you're, you're, you're pulling some threads together that make me slightly uncomfortable for, for reasons that I've explained. But we could perhaps describe it as your belief, and I have no doubt that your work would, would elevate this from belief to something a little more concrete. You are of the view that the, 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 the prominent far-right voices in this country um, who have a very, very, to be generous, strained relationship with anything that the rest of us would remotely recognise as the truth, are incre it's increasingly clear that they are pursuing similar aims to the Russian regime and the Russian regime's representative in the British media, Russia Today. Yes, and Nick, Nick Griffin is another one. Now, also the left. You also mentioned that the far left... I'm, I'm, um, I'm going to be late. I'm going to be late for the break. Um, Okay. So, it, 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 supporters. yes, in a sentence. And again, I, I, I look forward to reading more of your work, but I, I, I'm not fully knowledgeable um, uh, of some of the stuff you're talking about. So why do you think that some of Jeremy Corbyn's supporters are also very keen to poo-poo the notion that the Kremlin has exercised a malign influence over British politics? The Kremlin is very much cultivating the left as well. Um, the left are very keen on, on uh, Putin for, for some reason. Um, it goes back to them... Um, supporting the Soviet Union. It sort of goes through from there, even though Putin is no longer um, communist. But, um, uh, you know, um, he's seen as anti-imperialist. Uh, this is their belief. Even though he's annexed Crimea, they somehow see him as an anti-imperialist who stands up to the US. So we'll talk again, and, uh, and I, I will dig out your work and, um, and, and uh, educate myself by the sounds of it, because, as I say, I, I, I'm not going to pat myself on the back for being ahead of the game, because I'm clearly not ahead of the game, just a little bit further ahead than other people who do what I do for a living. But my goodness me, you do get the impression that the surface has only just been scratched. And it's, I suppose, fair to say that we did detect quite early on that the media uh, organisations sponsored by Russia, or the ones that are just absolutely crazy, like Infowars and Breitbart, were uh, influencing people on a scale that it took the Brexit vote to make us realise, I think. It's too late now to get the genie back in the bottle. But this is fascinating. Yuri Bezmanov, um, former KGB agent and journalist who defected, I think, to Canada. This is a quote from um, from him. He, he writes, My KGB instructors... And it was interesting what, what um, the last caller, Sarah Hurst, said about some of the kind of far-right poster boys and girls in this country, that dreadful Hopkins woman, and um, I, I, I wouldn't say I feel sorry for Tommy Robinson, but I have said to you in the past that if he had a monocle and a top hat, he'd be on Question Time every week, because um, his views are no different from those of people who, who do end up on Question Time every week, but the, 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 the weapons-grade ignorance of people who think he's been a victim of anything other than the rule of law and British justice is a direct result of, of Facebook disseminating um, fake news. But this is a brilliant quote because it plays in perfectly to what Sarah just said. My KGB instructors specifically made the point, never bother with leftists. This was my instruction. Try to get into large circulation, established conservative media. Wow. Cynical, egocentric people who can look into your eyes with an angelic expression and tell you a lie. These are the most recruitable people, people who lack moral principles, who are either too greedy or suffer too much from self-importance. They feel that they matter a lot. These are the people who the KGB wanted very much to recruit. So, let's take that line there. These are the most recruitable people, people who lack moral principles, who are either too greedy or suffer too much from self-importance. They feel that they matter a lot. These are the people who the KGB wanted very much to recruit. So that's from the former KGB agent Yuri Bezmanov. And just hold that in your mind while I remind you of the words written this weekend by the woman who ghost wrote Aaron Banks's book entitled, I'm not suggesting that this is evidence of somebody who suffers too much from self-importance, but the book was called um, The Bad Boys of Brexit.
And here it is. I was very surprised by what I found, which conflicted with the public accounts of the relationship with the Russian embassy that Banks and Wigmore had given. My analysis is that Banks and Wigmore were shamelessly used by the Russians. This is the woman they paid to write their book. Perhaps the Englishman did not mind. As always, the Kremlin's agenda was to weaken Western democracies by fueling political and social division, and in these two incredibly well-connected men, it had highly valuable and surprisingly willing tools. That is the woman that wrote Aaron Banks' book describing Aaron Banks. Here is a former KGB agent describing people that the KGB really liked to recruit. Cynical, egocentric people who can look into your eyes with an angelic expression and tell you a lie. Facts don't matter. Facts don't work. Only lies work, is a line that popped up in that book. These are the most recruitable people, people who lack moral principles, who are either too greedy or suffer too much from self-importance. I'm just juxtaposing those two paragraphs and inviting you to think on. The question I would like to ask Brexiters now is not, did you vote Brexit because of Russian interference? Because of course you didn't. Yeah, you're far too clever. Far too clever for that. So if you've got the guts to ring in, and I appreciate these days that none of you really do, even when I offer money, um, why do you think Russia was so keen to see Brexit happen? 03456060973. So I would not suggest for a moment that you fell for the propaganda that appears to have been promoted by the Kremlin, the breaking point posters and the ludicrous scaremongering about a refugee crisis caused largely by the Russian interventions in Syria. <laughs> Chicken and egg. But, but you're clever. That's why you voted to leave the European Union, because you're clever and you understand stuff. So could you explain to me why Russia was so keen to see Brexit happen. 03456060973. Don't be shy. Give us a ring. Kumar's in Ealing. Kumar, what would you like to say? Uh, good morning, sir. To answer your question, you have to understand three things about Putin. Number one, his MO. Number two, his psyche. And thirdly, motivation. I'd like to address those three issues, if I may. And if you of course you may. Your phone, your phone's a bit funny. It's like every third word seems to fade out. I don't know why that is, but, but, but um, I shall listen to you until it becomes unbearable. Not, not, not what you're saying. I mean, the quality of the phone line. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, carry on. OK. So, first of all, his MO. He's the, the, the purpose of destabilising Europe, because he wants America have... Uh, sorry, he wants Russia to have a greater influence in, in European affairs, because... His, uh, uh, his modus operandi is three things. Number one, cyber attack. Number two, the use of the gas cap to control uh, gas into uh, Europe. So other than Britain and Holland most of, and uh, Norway, most of Europe is dependent on Russian gas. Secondly, uh, he's using the, uh, the, or thirdly rather, he's using uh, uh, assassination squads like Skripal and Litvinenko. Don't forget, the, the reason he took out Litvinenko is because uh, uh, Litvinenko was about to spill the beans on these two uh, bo bombing attacks in Moscow buildings, which were allegedly reported at the time to be done by Chechens, when it actually turned out, putting Litvinenko, who's a former FSB officer, that he was actually in uh, covert... Uh, I am, I, I'm gonna, we're going to run out of time. If, if you just focus on, on, on sort of bullet points on each of the three things. So, so the MO is, is to, 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 to undermine the truth and to destabilise the West for, for commercial reasons, as well as protecting his power at home. Correct. And secondly, his, uh, his psyche, uh, 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 Putin is driven by three things. Number one, he comes from a very poor background. He wanted to make a lot of money, which he's done. Secondly, he wanted to eliminate all his enemies. If you look at, he's exiled, banished, or killed most of his opponents, uh, e.g. Berezovsky, Kordakovsky, Muzlinsky, and, and, and thirdly, he wants uh, basically to make Russia great again. Uh, in the, what in does that mean? A lot, rather like the Soviet Union, basically following Stalin. He wants, he wants to basically have spheres of influence, as he's now got in Syria. He wants to have spheres of influence in, in Europe. For example, he went to Vienna the other day because... Uh, Austria was the only country that did not expel any, any Russian diplomats. After, after they're, they're, they're also shutting down mosques and, and, and chucking out imams, which seems to be, despite the fact that Russia has a Muslim population of 10%, they do seem to have weaponized Islam very effectively in, in countries outside Russia. May I make a final point? Or do quickly. We have time? Yes, very okay. quickly. And then we go to his, uh, his uh, actual uh, motivation. As I said, basically is to make Russia great again. By that, I mean his influence and, uh, and uh, to become a world player. And remember, pre-Skripal, uh, there was a wedge between the, the, the uh, Europe and America. Post-Skripal, Europe and America together with the, with the expansion of all these diplomats. 
And, of course, the people who appear to have been um, uh, helping, colluding, what did Isabella Oakshot call them? Highly valuable and surprisingly willing tools. I'd go with every word of that. Um, they would be the very first to claim that they were somehow patriotic. These are interesting times. I am intrigued to know whether or not anybody is prepared to tell me why they think Russia wants Brexit from the perspective of also wanting it as well. I suppose I'm asking you how you've ended up in bed with Vladimir Putin. 0345 973 But we may, we may have run out of time. We could return to this. We've definitely returned to this later in the week. Uh, up next, why I would be a brilliant detective. Four minutes after 11 is the time. I, I'm not going to carry on with that conversation for two reasons. The first is it's not really a phone-in. I think we, we got lucky with Sarah and Kumar. They seem to know their stuff. It, you take calls from anybody who knows their stuff and could argue a different position because... It kind of would involve denying that the woman who's written the book about Aaron Banks and Andy Wigmore um, understands Aaron Banks and Andy Wigmore. I don't know who's going to mount the defence if their own house chronicler has turned on them um, in order to, to protect their own reputation, presumably. Um, so that's reason number one why we're not going to carry on, because I can't think of anything else to say. And reason number two, well, we could have circus, we could have sport, with all of the people who are absolutely convinced that the Russians had nothing to do with their decision to vote Brexit, telling me why they think Russia is so keen to see Brexit. But that, I don't know, it seems a little bit trivial in the context of the big issues and the tectonic plates that are shifting beneath us. Question about why the rest of the media won't go in as hard on this story as the Observer has done. Sunday Times very, very late to the party for slightly questionable reasons. Well, it's simple. Just look at, um, they'll be the same as the callers. Uh, people who supported Brexit but can't explain why Kremlin are so desperate to see it happen. If, you, if you're a newspaper editor who told your readers to vote for Brexit, you need to now tell them why the Kremlin, why an enemy of this country is so keen for us to do this thing. And you're not going to get many newspaper editors prepared to explain that to their readers because it would kind of involve admitting that you, you've encouraged your readers to do what the Kremlin wanted. And the second reason why I don't think we're going to talk about it anymore is because we're going to come back to it in the course of the week. Um, we'll, we'll get Carol Cadwallader on, I'm sure. It's typical. I, she must have thought it was my... She probably didn't realise it was my day off yesterday when she was trying to get onto this programme. I'm sure it was just sort of between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock yesterday morning, trying to get onto this slot. Even tweeting about how she couldn't get put through. It's, it's quite bizarre. She must have just... I hope she didn't think it was me. And we'll also, I think, speak to James Patrick, who deserves recognition for having reported this to the authorities seven months ago. I've seen the document that he sent to them and it describes pretty much exactly what Isabel Oakshot coughed to in the Sunday Times yesterday. I hope that makes sense. I agree, Mr. Tom.